Welcome to Bridging the Gap, where we gather the creative powerhouses behind your favorite Disney Plus movies and series together for a real, no-holds-barred conversation about identity, community, and driving social change through storytelling. I'm your host, Bria Baker. I'm so excited to be joined by some of the brilliant talent from Walt Disney Animation Studios who recently worked on Raya and the Last Dragon. Today, we're gonna to be talking about what it means to be first and second generation American. I was made fun of at school. I purposely stopped speaking Arabic. My peers that weren't Asian obviously would remind me that I was Asian. When you do have people behind the camera telling the stories that are authentic to them, it shines through. Hi everyone. I'm so excited to get into this conversation because today we're gonna to talk about what it means to be first or second generation American, how that's impacted each of you personally, and also how it's shaped and inspired you as storytellers. And I just wanna start by asking, what does it feel like to have made something that means so much to people? I'm so grateful that I was a part of the film. And it was incredible to send a message of hope and unity in order to build something bigger than oneself. I had the privilege of growing up in many different places and seeing different cultures. So that aspect of Raya, of all these cultures coming together as one was something that I feel like was something personal to myself. Definitely, I mean, and as the writer, this has to be a dream come true. It's a thing that I always wanted to give my kids an opportunity to look up at the screen and see a hero that looks like them, that they could put on a cape and a hat and a sword and feel like they could save the world. It makes Rise such an incredible thing that it even exists, mm -hmm. but to be part of it is uh, a dream beyond something I could have ever hoped for. When I first told my parents I wanted to be an animator, first thing they responded with was, what's an animator? Coming from Cuba into the States, they really didn't understand all the careers that you could possibly have. So when I told them that my dream was to really work in films and tell stories, they were excited for me. They just didn't understand how you got there. And neither did I to be honest. Now that I've brought my parents into the studio and I've been able to show them the process of animation and how we create performances that then you can see in, in the movies, they have a, a better understanding of what it is I do every day. It's been really incredible and rewarding as a first generation Cuban American to be able to share with them the success behind the films that I've made and seeing them be so proud of me. So let's jump right in. These words mean so many different things to different people based on where we come from. So I think it's best to start with the basics of how do you each identify as either first or second generation American? And what has that experience meant to you? I guess in technical terms, I would consider myself first generation American because I was born in Egypt and then I immigrated away from there. Same with my parents. But in some ways I consider myself second generation just because I've spent most of my life in the West, whereas my parents, spent most of their life in Egypt. And the cultural divide that we have between each other is so vast that I kind of differentiate the cultural generations that way. That's interesting because I actually consider myself a first generation, even though my parents were born in Cuba and then they immigrated here. Now I'm looking at it differently. I would consider myself a second generation and my parents first generation. I mean, I was born here. Uh, my parents are refugees. And so I think I'm like Rebecca. It's always the, the generational yeah. things. I was like, I always thought I was first generation because they were refugees and I was the first generation American right. in the mm -hmm. family. But I guess by Yasser's definition, I'm a second generation American. Mm -hmm. The thing that I think defines it the most for me is being like kind of in between cultures, right? Mm, like, yeah. like for my parents, yeah. they are definitely Vietnamese and there's obviously a cultural separation between me and them in that way, even though they're my parents and I love them. Mm -hmm. But then I also don't fit in completely. I grew up in Southern Arkansas. And so I was always reminded that I didn't look like everybody mm. else. So I was kind of like mm. an in-between American yeah. <laughs> in that sense, you know, cause yeah. like my peers that weren't Asian obviously would remind me that I was Asian mm. or Vietnamese specifically. And then my parents were always like, oh, you're so not like us. You're totally American. By living in that middle place is where I think myself and a lot of children of immigrants have grown up in. A lot of us don't neatly fit into categories. Yeah, that's so true. On the one hand, um, feeling so American, and then on the other hand, being reminded by peers that you are not neatly in that box. Would you all say that you had a similar experience to Queen in that regard, or was that different based on where you lived? Because I know Miami is a very different experience than Arkansas. <laughs> when you go to Miami, if you don't speak Spanish, you feel out of place. <laughs> right. So it wasn't until I moved out, and actually moved after college to San Francisco, that I experienced something outside of my culture and realized just how different I was in comparison. 
And there is a bit of like figuring out like how to assimilate mm. to a situation. Yeah. I almost yeah. feel like as immigrants, yeah. you almost feel like depending on the situation you're in, you lean into whatever works, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when you're at home, you're whatever works there. Yeah. But it's all you. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the irony. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to find your identity when you're kind of faced with that situation. For me, living in Egypt and the US and Australia, they all have very different cultures and very different ideas. Trying to fit in um, was always a challenge because I, I always felt like I had to change myself. When we first immigrated from Egypt to Australia, the big cultural divide there was so drastic and we moved into this small, majority white, small town, maybe about 100,000 people. So mm -hmm. we were only maybe one of two families that were immigrants. I was made fun of at school and I purposely stopped speaking Arabic. It was all because I was trying so hard to fit in. To me, it's a little bit of an unfortunate thing because if I were to go back to that, I would more embrace that heritage yeah. because to me, that's far more enriching. And it's so interesting to see the difference between that coming of age and like that fitting in happening when you're more fully formed mm -hmm. in your personality yeah. versus when yeah. you're a child and you feel some of those pressures a bit deeper. So now how did you navigate that balancing act, trying to fit in mm. while also trying to be authentically who you are in multiple homes? So I found comfort in finding people in the community who shared the similar ideas, who embraced my background and what I have to offer, and then just kind of like situating myself within those groups, introducing those groups also to my family so that my family knows like what I'm surrounding myself with, and then just kind of keeping that circle um, pretty tight. Yeah, and what about you two? I think I also, in hindsight now, I realized that the friends I befriended were similar to me, but very mm. different. Mm. Right, they were also kids who had multiple cultures mm -hmm. and in every aspect, right? Because even Caucasian friends who come from maybe a place that they don't fully fit in, maybe there's someone who identifies in the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. already they're dealing with multiple right. versions of themselves mm -hmm. in different spaces. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much I tried to be anything. You know, you kind of just accidentally do that, right? Like, yeah. you are what your friends are, right? Like, I grew up primarily, like, in a middle-class, like, black neighborhood. So that was definitely part of who I was. It wasn't until I left that neighborhood that I realized that I wasn't exactly like my friends, mm -hmm. you know? At a certain point, your world is first your house, mm -hmm. then your neighborhood, then the city, and then it gets bigger and bigger, right? right. But one of the things that helped affect my, 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 my self-esteem was a grand lie that my parents told me and my grandma told me. And that was that my small town in isolation was the only town that wasn't Vietnamese in all of America. <laughs> Even when I knew it was a lie, I held on to it because it was the one little thing that was like, you know what, it might not be actually true, but maybe I can make it true. Right. And so right. It, was, it was stuff like that that, that kind of uh, helped build me up. I felt empowered by my identity in kind of the most indirect way. When I was really small, I couldn't speak English basically at all. And my teachers told my parents that they needed to stop speaking Vietnamese to me so I could have a chance to speak English. But this meant my grandmother, who only spoke Vietnamese, couldn't speak to me anymore. And I remember the conversation she told me when I was around four. Right now, I have to stop talking to you. What I need you to do is learn how to talk like them. I know the superpower you're gonna have one day is going to be speaking like them and telling our stories using their language. It was the thing that made me have a mission. It's my mission to tell their stories, but it's also my mission to tell the stories of anyone who often only gets to see themselves in one kind of light. How do you think being an American with multiple cultural identities has shaped your creative voice? Especially in animation, it tends to be a very male-dominated industry, and I think personally what I feel I bring that's authentic to mm -hmm. myself, and I wish that more women would join the field is the woman's perspective, yeah. right? When you do have people behind the camera telling the stories that are authentic to them, mm -hmm. it shines through. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as an animator, that's what I try to bring. I gravitate towards strong, independent female characters that I can bring a voice to, mm -hmm. that I can bring that to the world so I can show my girls mm -hmm. an example of 
what they can be in life. Wow, and you nailed that with this. When I was living in Egypt, um, my parents uh, introduced me to a famous Disney animated film, and it was called Aladdin. Yeah. And something about that film really resonated with me. It had such good representation of my culture, and just seeing the beauty of what the animators have done, it really made me push hard to want to be able to do something like that in my life. The idea of sharing a story like that, kind of introducing the world to a different culture and understanding those values were something that I I felt like really resonated with me. The privilege of growing up in all these different places is I've been able to absorb different cultures and different ideas and to bring that back into the world of storytelling is a way that I can contribute to the world. When you're not from that culture you end up having to do it through research and then you go and sit down and you write this and you want to honor all of that but what happens then it becomes like a history lesson it mm -hmm. becomes like this high-end kind of version that feels very stiff and unlived in Rye is a good example of when we first hit that movie I know that we really desperately wanted to honor and show a lot of respect to the cultures that we were inspired by mm -hmm. I wanted Raya to feel like an authentic kid who made mistakes, who was fallible. Because there was me and Fawn, who's head of story, who's Thai, and Adele, who's my co-writer, who's Malaysian. There were people that were authentically from that culture. We were able to go, this is what we really are. That type of storytelling can only come from those who come from those cultures. My parents moved to Australia because they wanted to find a better life for me. When I first told them that I wanted to be a filmmaker, they were very supportive. The only thing that they've expected from me was to take that opportunity and make the most of it. The project I'm most proud of is Frozen 2. As a crowd supervisor, I was able to work with the art directors and the animators to create palettes that represented people from all around the world. We wanted Arendelle to feel like it was a fictional world, but not necessarily in a specific place. So we wanted to be able to make sure that it was welcoming of all cultures. I felt very excited to see it on the screen and just to see audience's reaction to the increased diversity and how much more acceptance there was towards the characters in the film and that's something that was incredibly special. What are your hopes for the future of representation both behind and in front of the camera? I think it's important for studios to increase um, diversity in the workplace and increase representation. Having people from different cultures and different backgrounds come into the workplace, um, it increases the capacity for creativity, it brings new ideas. I think overall it enriches the content. We're all better off for it. Definitely, yeah. Growing up, I actually had no idea that there was such a career. Like people actually got paid to make movies. And then when I got into the industry and realized the power, the connection you can make and the voice you can give. Raya is a perfect example and so is Encanto, which is the last film that I just wrapped on. It's tapping into a culture and showing a perspective of a community that I hadn't seen growing up and that I wish I had. I'm grateful I'm being a part of it and, and a voice so that other girls and kids that are Latin descent can see themselves on screen and know that there is a possibility beyond them as long as they dare to dream. I think it's a huge responsibility to be able to tell stories that kind of uplift our society, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, a personal mission has always been to try to create heroes for those who don't often get to see themselves depicted that way. Because wow. often when you're not of a certain look, sex, and gender, and sexuality, you often are kind of put in small little categories and boxes. You know, you're, you're a supporting character to them. I think it's, it's such a great time to be a creator right now. There's so many avenues, everything from theatrical to streaming. There's just so many more opportunities to be able to tell so many more diverse stories. Yeah. And in that diversity allows us to be able to tell more stories for those who need it. One million percent. It's a lot of yeah. you being a part of this project, you being a part of this project, even though you're not Southeast Asian, there's still an element mm -hmm. that you're able to bring to it and feel reflected. And again, it shows that we do have so much more in common. So we've talked a lot about who supported you all in those balancing acts, whether that was family members or other stories that you had seen as a child, whether it's for your children or for just the next generation, what responsibility you feel to help them balance their cultural identities and for that to be just a little bit smoother than it was for each of you. I think it's important for us to make more movies. Movies like Raya, uh, representing Asian cultures, movies like Encanto, representing Latin American culture. I think the more that we can diversify our plate, the more that we can introduce the next generation to this globalized world which we now live in. When you're Hispanic or Latin, you're the cleaning lady, you are the caregiver, you know, the nanny. And there's so much more to our mm -hmm. culture, right, as there is for every culture. And I think that's the responsibility that a company like Disney or storytellers like us afford the next generation. 
mm. is to not just see themselves in bigger arenas, like seeing Raya as like this strong, independent person, but also flawed, because that that's a truth of who we are. We're not the perfect one. So the more content we create that discusses and points out different cultures and experiences, right. the more opportunities we get to create those nuances in those performances. And not every character has to hinge and be the hero. Mm -hmm. And they can't, they have to be perfect. No, because yeah. nobody is. You know, my, my kids are biracial. The half of them that is Caucasian is very well taken care of in America. I just want them to be able to feel as much pride, as much identity, as much gratitude of that half of them as they do of the other half. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of this conversation. It was so beautiful. And I'm really looking forward to everything that you all are a part of in the future. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for having us. To see some of the Walt Disney Animation Studios films our guests have brought to life, you can stream their amazing work, including Raya and the Last Dragon, now on Disney+. We'll see you next time.